Erev Tov Nahariya, Boker Tov, Boker Raton, and a meaningful Memorial Day weekend to all of our friends commemorating, remembering service people over this holiday weekend. Today, our Friends Indeed series takes us on an amazing live virtual tour by our friend and renowned tour guide, Reuben Solomon, who has guided numerous AIFL delegations over two decades in Israel. We also have uh, some of our AIFL delegation alumni from around the country who are also on the Zoom screen today as part of our virtual tour group, and they'll hopefully have a chance to ask some questions live with Ruben. We have Susie Cooper, a Yasi Youth Ambassador Student Exchange student who's now in Detroit, who's with us. Dr. Don Weinroth, who was with us with a superintendent's uh, uh, mission from Oklahoma City. Rosa Solorio uh, from our influential women's delegation, uh, who's now in Virginia. And Jeanette Manning, who's also an influential woman, but she was with us on a different delegation with the National Association of Attorney Generals uh, based here in Washington, D.C., but calling in from Maryland, uh, where I am today as well. For everyone on this call, whether on Zoom or on Facebook, we want to ask you to use your chat function. And first of all, just start off by telling us about your favorite spot in Jerusalem. Where was it when, when you actually visited last? Was it a Mamuna celebration in Gan Safar? Was it drinking tea, Nana, with that minty uh, spice that you can only get in the Middle East on the Midrachov in some uh, small cafe? Were you visiting and walking around the Four Quarters in Jerusalem on foot and wondering how your feet are gonna hold up at the end of the day. Whatever that is, you can kick back, you can relax. We've got a great uh, program for uh, you today. We do want you to feel free to send in your questions, uh, you know, throughout uh, and uh, we'll try to get a question in if we can, time permitting. But even if we can't, we promise that Reuven will answer the questions afterwards if there's something burning that you weren't able to get in during your delegation. So I already see people writing in Temple Mount was a favorite uh, uh, of, 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 of someone in uh, the, the, on the Zoom chat. For everybody on Facebook, let's share the love, right? All you have to do is hit watch party. Uh, it took me only a couple of times and a couple of teenagers in the house to explain it to me. So uh, if you have one of those things and some patience, go ahead and uh, just hit uh, uh, watch party, Share, you know, you're sharing it and then other people who have nothing to do on uh, Memorial Day Sunday today can uh, join in as well. Um, I want to begin now uh, by sharing uh, a couple of messages, because as you know, it's Yom Yerushalayim this week in uh, Jerusalem, and we have a special greeting from the mayor of uh, Jerusalem to kick off our program, uh, Mayor Moshe Leon. Jerusalem. The city which lies in the heart of millions of people around the world. So the Jewish people, this is the very center of the universe. Every stone in this city tells a story. And the story of this city, the story of Jerusalem, is one of faith. It is one of hope. And uh, it is a story of renewal. From the destruction of the first temple, Jerusalem has been built and rebuilt many times. And 53 years ago, we reunited the city and began to rebuild it this time forever. 53 years ago, Jerusalem became whole and since then we have come a long way just behind me here was a border until 1967 before Israel freed the city the old city lay in ruins holy places and were left to decay or worse destroyed. However, today we are proud that Jerusalem is thriving as a place of faith and culture and as a place of innovation and trade. 
we have seen in the last weeks how Jerusalem's hospitals and medical centers face the challenge of the coronavirus, saving lives and keeping us safe. Yes, the cost of the lockdown has been very high, but, but uh, just as we always have, we will rebuild. We will rise up and we continue to hold the torch of high of the hope high as we see to the world. Jerusalem is of course the light for the whole world. These have been dark times for Jewish communities around the world. And I hope that on this Jerusalem day we can all stand together and share in the light. I hope that we mark another year of free, united Jerusalem. We can all say Leshana Habaa Birushalayim. I hope we can welcome you all to Jerusalem very soon. Happy Jerusalem Day. And from the offices of the municipality of Jerusalem to the streets of Jerusalem, I now want to uh, introduce our special friend and a repeat AIFL webinar participant, Jerusalem Deputy Mayor Fleur Hassan Nahum. Hello, everyone, and happy Jerusalem Day to all of you in the America-Israel Friendship League. I'm so proud to be able to speak to you today. I understand that you're going to have incredible virtual tours of the old city for all religions. Jerusalem really is the center of the world. And it's not just the capital city for the people who live here, but it's also the capital city for all our Jewish family and friends around the world. And so today, through the virtual tours, I hope you reconnect to Jerusalem and to its wonders and to the layers and layers of history until you can come back and visit us in person. Enjoy. Okay. Now for uh, the real fun. Reuben, I know it's been a sweltering week of heat in Israel, but Jerusalem's always just a little bit cooler. Uh, it seems to me every time that, that I'm there, I have to put on a jacket or a sweater, regardless of what time of year. Um, it's an escape. It's an escape to the, for the senses of smell and taste and sound. It's timeless. Uh, so where are you going to start us on this timeless uh, tour to Jerusalem? Well, Wayne, actually, I'm sitting here in, at home in Kfar Vradim, which has similar weather to Jerusalem. And believe it or not, it rained heavily last night and rained this morning. And the temperature has dropped from uh, last week by about 10 degrees Celsius in a day. So uh, that's why I have a long sleeve shirt on. And uh, I want to say shalom to all of you. Uh, it's so lovely to see so many friendly faces greetings and i'm so glad and so happy to be with you once again today uh it's a very appropriate day to actually tour jerusalem because as uh, the present day mayor of jerusalem mentioned 53 years have passed since the city of jerusalem has been united we celebrated that on friday and it's also a special occasion for our muslim friends because uh tonight at uh uh, on Sunday night, uh, at sundown, uh, the uh, Eid al uh will come to a conclusion. The uh, um, holiday that marks the end of Ramadan. So we say to our Muslim friends, Eid Mubarak. And uh, as I said, ideal time to visit Jerusalem. But, you know, visiting Jerusalem uh, is not a 45 or one hour uh, visit. It's days and weeks and months. Uh, so in this very limited time that we have, we're going to concentrate on uh, a small uh, portion of Jerusalem, a small part of Jerusalem, and uh, deal mainly with uh, its connection with the three major monotheistic religions, the great religions of the world, and their connection with Jerusalem. 
So uh, welcome to uh, the virtual tour and I hope that you all enjoy it. You see the slide with the golden dome, uh, almost in the center, the Dome of the Rock. And that's where we're going to begin our visit to Jerusalem because that's the first Jewish connection to Jerusalem. Under that golden dome is what we believe was Mount Moriah, where Abraham nearly sacrificed Isaac, our first patriarch, nearly sacrificing Isaac on a hill called Mount Moriah, surrounded by hills, as we say, Yerushalayim Harim Savivla, Jerusalem surrounded by hills. Well, Mount Moriah was not the highest, but a central hill in Jerusalem. And herein begins the Jewish connection. In the time of King David, when many uh, areas are conquered by the 12 tribes of Israel, one sliver of a city, a, a fortified city, controlled by the Jebusites, remains unconquered. So when King David wants to build a capital city and unite the 12 tribes around, uniting them to one capital city, he needs to choose a place that is neutral, like a Washington DC. It can't, can't be in any tribal land. It has to be a neutral area. And King David decides to conquer the Jebusite city and he does so and he wants to build the house of the Lord to the north of the city outside the present uh, day when he conquers it, city walls. He doesn't get to do that. It's his son Solomon who gets to build the first temple on Mount Moriah, the very site where Abraham really sacrificed Isaac after King David incidentally purchases that site from Aruna the Jebusite who wants to gift it to David but uh, King David says this is a gift I'm giving to God and you don't give you repackage a present you got it has to be titled and deeded and he purchases a land for 50 silver shekels but it is Solomon who builds the beautiful first temple to the north of the city outside the city walls. Now in the time of Solomon, Jerusalem is extended and expanded, but when Solomon dies, uh, the kingdom splits. Ten leaders of ten of the tribes, I have to remind you the tribal system had already broken down, but ten leaders of ten of the tribes take with them whoever from their tribes want to come with them to the northern kingdom and establish a rival kingdom to the kingdom of Judah. Now, in 721 BC, the northern kingdom is demolished by the Assyrian conquest. The Assyrians then turn their eyes to Jerusalem, but these are the days of Isaiah and Hezekiah, and Hezekiah strengthens the walls of Jerusalem, building the broad wall. He brings the water that was flowing outside the city of David into the city. And the Assyrians, as Isaiah had prophesied, do not fire and do not shoot an arrow within the walls of Jerusalem. However, shortly after that, 586 BCE, Nebuchadnezzar, the Babylonian, attacks Jerusalem in the days of Zedekiah and raises it to the ground, to Solomon's temple and Jerusalem raised to the ground. The Assyrians, when they conquered their people, scattered them. And this gives rise to the 10 lost tribes of Israel, the legend of the 10 lost tribes of Israel. But the Babylonians behaved very differently. They took their people and exported them en masse to disorient them, but to have them organized enough not to be a burden. And so the Jews are exiled by the waters of Babylon. It is by the waters of Babylon that they are asked to sing their beautiful songs of the temple when they respond, 
how can we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? If I forget thee, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget her cunning. Let my tongue cleave to the roof of my mouth. If I remember thee not above my chiefest joy, Jerusalem. This is when Zionism is born. It's not a new phenomenon. 2,500 years ago, the Jews by the waters of Babylon long for a return to Jerusalem. That is not long in coming when the Persians overthrow the Babylonians and Cyrus, who we call the good king, allows conquered people to go back to their lands, their homeland, and rebuild. These are the days of Ezra and Nehemiah, and in 519 BCE, Jerusalem is rebuilt, and a very poor reproduction of Solomon's temple is built on the very site where <clears throat> the first temple stood. The um, <clears throat> period of the Persians uh, soon gives way to Alexander the Great, who in 332 BCE conquers Jerusalem, and this becomes what is known as the, Hel the beginning of the Hellenization <clears throat> of the area. As soon as Alexander dies, his uh, kingdom is uh, rivaled for by his different generals, and we fall in between two of them. Pompey to the south and Seleucid to the north, and we are in between them. A particularly nasty Seleucid ruler in 141 BCE, uh, and you know this well, the story, because we Jews celebrate it every year at Hanukkah, the rededication of the temple, is when Antiochus Epiphanes IV destroys, first of all, desecrates the temple, plundering it. And this gives rise to a revolt uh, led by Mathathias or Matityahu from a priestly family who revolts against the Greek regime and miraculously this family-led revolt ends up in overthrowing the Greek regime, leading the country into nearly a hundred years of Hasmonean Jewish sovereignty in Jerusalem. Jerusalem is rebuilt. It is <clears throat> expanded and uh, during the Hasmonean period and uh, Unfortunately, the Hasmoneans uh, bring about their self-destruction when brother fights brother about who will take over rule. And Pompey, the Roman, is invited in in 63 BC to settle the dispute. The Romans come in and remain. This period uh, of uh, Roman uh, Second Temple period, because the Second Temple still stands, um, <clears throat> is punctuated by uh, troubles uh, and it is uh, in 40 BC when a Jew, Herod the Great, is appointed by Rome to be the Jewish king of the Roman province of Judea. Herod the Great's uh, most masterful work was the rebuilding that you saw in the previous couple of slides that we will go back to, um, the rebuilding of Jerusalem and the refurbishing of the very beautiful uh, temple that he replaces uh, the uh, temple of Ezra and Nehemiah with. And now you see this, uh, the slide that marks a wonderful model, scale model, 50 to 1 scale model that today stands in the Israel Museum of Jerusalem on the eve of her destruction. The centerpiece, of course, this 50 to 1 uh, ratio is the temple mount, it's, uh, the, the temple mount itself and the glorious temple in the center of the picture that you see that Herod builds, rebuilds. Now, just before Herod dies, Jesus is born in Bethlehem, about a 20-minute ride from Jerusalem, and we're going to come back to 
the Christian side of the story. But uh, after Herod dies, things deteriorate badly. By 66, 65 CE or AD, the trouble explodes and the Jews go to war against the Romans, the Jewish war. If you want to read a most horrific description of warfare <clears throat> that you could imagine, <clears throat> read the chapter in the Jewish war of Yosef ben Matityahu or Josephus of the destruction of Jerusalem. Jerusalem is totally destroyed by Titus and the 10th legion of the Roman army. And once again, the Jews are exiles in their own land. The Roman destruction of Jerusalem ends up in a scattering again of the peoples. But less than 60 years later, 70 years later, another revolt takes place, the Bar Kokhba revolt, which is very, very strongly put down by the Emperor Hadrian, who imposes a new name on the Roman province of Judea, to Jewish sounding. He calls it Palestina Secunda, the Roman province of Palestina, which takes uh, uh, the name from the um, disposed Philistines who vied for the land. Now, He also gives a new name to Jerusalem, Aelia Capitolina, his capital. And uh, the Jews are expelled from Jerusalem and once again, strangers in their own land. The years of exile, 2000 years of exile, have a whole list of conquests and reconquests with the Muslim conquest, and then the Crusaders in 1099, and then Saladin with the Muslims again, ousting the first Crusader kingdom, and then the Crusaders come back, and they're ousted by Baibars the Mameluk in 12, in the end of the 1200s, and then once again, uh, Jerusalem is in the hands of uh, Muslims, and uh, they're succeeded by the Ottomans, who in 1517 become the rulers of the area, right up until 1917. In Rick, 19 Rick, quick question. Um, uh, the questions and comments are just flying in. Already a question about uh, archaeological evidence for the first temple. Wonderful, wonderful question. The Babylonians did a very thorough job of destroying everything that Solomon had built, but what they didn't destroy was what was under the later uh, monumental city of David, okay. where the evidence of King David and King Solomon come to life with names from the Bible popping up out of the ground from that very period. We can connect with findings in the city of David directly the uh, uh, the uh, ministers of King Zedekiah who were sent to Jeremiah to tell him to stop uh, bad-mouthing the king. And their names are in seals that we found in the city of David. So yes, the archaeological evidence is very solid. In fact, Elat Mazar, and most of us totally agree with her, thinks she has found the palace of King David. Um, uh, and uh, uh, the archaeological evidence certainly supports her thoughts. So yes, there is archaeological evidence, but not of the temple that was thoroughly raised by the Babylonians. So um, to continue, we have the Ottoman period coming to an end with the uh, uh, Allies' victory in the First World War, and uh, a trickle of Jews coming mainly at first from Eastern Europe to create the new Jew, to uh, settle a land, the ancient land, where Jews, after 2,000 years of wandering, will be at home again. Now, in the British mandate, this involved a struggle. It didn't come easy. But after the, I would say, 
the lowest point of uh, Jewish existence uh, during the Second World War and the Holocaust, the United Nations decides that part of the land will be of Palestine, that name that Hadrian gave it, will be the Jewish state. And after the British mandate is over, on the 14th of May, 1948, Ben-Gurion declares the independence of Israel in a slither of <laughs> You're hearing the actual recorded voice of David Ben-Gurion at uh, this momentous event in a nondescript hall of an art museum that was the home of the first mayor of Tel Aviv, uh, a most unlikely place for a grand declaration of independence, but boy was it grand. I would like to read you Israel. I still get goosebumps when I hear that. I, I would like to read you a, a thought of a representative that was uh, at this uh, independence meeting. Her name was Rachel Kagan. He, she was the Witzel representative, and this is what she writes. I won't forget the tikva when we sang it. It sounded different, the sound of a hope that came true. A trumpet blast of joy dil dilated with sadness. This sadness came from the knowledge that some of us had that the Arab armies were already approaching our borders. We knew that our boys would soon be leaving or had already left for the front. How would we stand up to the challenge? We had faith, but there was also fear. And by this, our happiness was tempered by sadness. I also remember leaving the museum. Evening was falling, the sky was blue, but in the West, it was reddening from the setting sun. There was a kind of symbolism in this, the blue of hope, peace, and serenity, and the red of fire and blood. The War of Independence was very costly. 1% of the entire Jewish population of the land, 6,000 people of 600,000, gave their lives in that war. It ended up with the Jews holding onto more land than the partition plan of the United Nations allowed for, but Jerusalem remained a divided city. And for 20 years, Jerusalem was a divided city until, and once again, you know, Ben-Gurion said it best of all, and he's been paraphrased many times, that in this land, if you don't believe in miracles, you're not a realist. And in the Six Day War, Jerusalem was reunited as a, an undivided city. And uh, here you see, once again, Jews by the wall. You're going to hear a song that has to be one of my favorite songs, Jerusalem of Gold. And I want to tell you a little bit about this song. You know, it was the mayor, Teddy Koch, who was mayor at the time that Jerusalem was reunited, who asked songwriters to write a song about Jerusalem before the Six Day War. And they turned him down because Jerusalem's not the hottest of topics. One songwriter, Naomi Shema, writes this song. It's a song of longing of Jerusalem, of regretting how sad it is that we can't go down to the Dead Sea by way of Jericho, how sad that the water systems are dry and that the marketplaces are empty and they're not used by the Temple Mount and by the Western Mount. A song of longing. Incredibly, this song gains 
tremendous success. And young Shuli Natan, who you can hear in the background, had to repeat his singing that song, and I'm saying before the Six Day War. A few days later, Naomi Shema had to add another verse. The verse that says, Now we do go down to the Dead Sea by way of Jericho. The water systems are refilling. The marketplaces are busy. And there are Jews by the Temple Mount and the rest of them. For 2,000 years after a separation from the most important site to Judaism, the Jew are back in charge of their own destiny on a slither of land. That's the Jewish connection. The next slide you're going to see is very iconic. Those three paratroopers by the Western Wall, then and now. After 2,000 years, Jerusalem reunited, and as the present day mayor just said, to never be divided again. From here, we're going to move on to Christianity and its link with Jerusalem. Now, Ruben, yes, sir. I, I was just going to add, I, I just hate interrupting. <laughs> You've got so much to talk about. But just uh, the question earlier about the first temple evidence, I just thought I would add that one of our delegations, well, all of them now, participate in the sifting project up in the North Kidron Valley. And one of our students found the a part of an idol from first temple period in during one of those sifting uh, experiences and so there's evidence that is continuing to turn up absolutely and you know what uh, um hezekiah said about those idols destroy your idols so some of the jews were playing it safe backing it each way as they say yeah. So if you have a no smoking sign, someone's smoking. And if you have destroy your idol sign, someone's keeping idols under their bed. And as you say, some parts of them have been found. So folks, we're now going to move to uh, the Christian connection. Now, I have to tell you that uh, you need much more than a 14-day intensive pilgrimage to see even a small part of uh, the Christian sites in the Holy Land and hopefully in a future virtual visit. I hope uh, maybe not because uh, this Corona business will be over by quickly enough, I hope. But if not, we will uh, also have a tour perhaps of the uh, Christian sites around the north and the Sea of Galilee. But for today, I have to limit myself to the last hours of uh, Jesus's life on earth as man in order to uh, abide by the time constraints. So we're going to uh, concentrate on the last few hours, the last day of uh, Jesus' time on earth to tell the story of the deep connection between Christianity and Jerusalem. You may remember that Jesus called the Temple Mount, the Holy of Holies, the house of his father. But here, we're going to uh, pick up where Jesus spends his last night on earth as man in a garden where olives are grown, beaten off the trees, crushed and squeezed for the olive oil, very, very symbolic of uh, where the last night is spent. And in this garden that didn't have this beautiful church standing on it then, of course, but it had olive presses, is where Jesus asks the disciples to stay awake with him and watch. They fall asleep and he says to them, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. That beautiful church that you saw in the previous slide, and perhaps we can go back to it to give you another view of it, is a... Church of All Nations, built by that brilliant architect, Antonio Bellucci, who rebuilt in the 1920s many uh, Byzantine churches. And the way he was able to do this 
is that he had the plans. The floor plan was always there in the archaeology, but you need more than a floor plan to build a church. And fortunately for us, the Byzantines or Byzantines left many pictures of their churches and mosaics in Turkey and Jordan and in Israel and many other parts of the world as well. And when Antonio Bellucci was able to find a, a mosaic picture that fit the floor plan, he knew he had the church. And this All Nations Church is built on the very site where the earlier Byzantine church was built in the fourth, fifth century. Inside this beautiful church with its spectacular facade is bedrock that is called the Rock of Agony. That is the rock where Jesus falls and asks for the cup to be raised from him, but not his will, but his father's will. Here, in the early hours of the morning, he is betrayed, captured and taken to the house of Caiaphas, where he held overnight and in the morning, uh, produced before Pontius Pilatus. The last hours, if we can go to uh, the next slide, you will see, and the next one, this is incidentally a 2000 year old olive tree. Then this slide shows us the 14 stations they're marked on in, superimposed on a Byzantine re, uh, model, if you like, of Jerusalem of its day. In other words, fifth century, uh, where the uh, root of sorrow, the way that Jesus was uh, led to crucifixion and resurrection is marked in the stations from 1 to 14 with the last four stations inside the uh, building that uh, Helena Constantine's mother built over what she believed were the final stations of the cross. We shall be following this route, uh, but I want to make clear that uh, uh, there were several other ideas of where the route would have gone. Uh, this is mainly a route that is followed by the Eastern Orthodox and by the Catholic uh, branch. Uh, but th there is very much agreement of the route actually because of the uh, condemnation in the uh, Antonia Fortress to the seven, number seven station where Jesus is led outside of the city walls towards the site of crucifixion. Now, um, as I said, this is a, a Byzantine model that this route has been so superimposed on. And I'm not going to be taking any sides, but in the next slide, we'll talk about uh, the two possible sites of crucifixion and more importantly, resurrection, all in near proximity to each other. What you're seeing here is the courtyard of the present day Church of the Holy Sepulchre. You can make out the very crusader additions here. And uh, Helena had built this uh, site in 335 CE uh, because she was told that here was the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea, where Jesus was uh, laid in and from here he was resurrected. And she builds a massive church around the site. Gordon of Khartoum, General Gordon in the late 1800s, comes to visit the church and he is very bitterly disappointed. He said, this can't be the site. It's within city walls. He didn't realize, of course, that in the time of Jesus, it would not have been within city walls. And more so, it's a church and not a garden. And uh, disappointed, he walks around the outside of the walls of the city. And we're going to take that walk that takes him outside the Damascus Gate. In the next slide, you will see that he looks across from the Damascus gate and he sees what appears to be a garden tomb with a tomb and a rolling stone. But what brings it to his attention is what you're going to see in the next slide. A skull-shaped rock in the side of the cliff. Golgotha, Golgolet, skull in Hebrew Aramaic that uh, incredibly existed in that uh, chapel that was covered in the courtyard of the Holy Sepulcher and existed too here. And in both sites, amazingly, amazingly, a tomb was found that could be uh, called tomb of a wealthy man, Joseph of Arimathea. 
Amazingly, both sites were in most likelihood used by the Romans for public execution because they were on main routes and they were outside the city walls. So I'm not going to take any sides. Uh, Protestants like to visit both sites usually. Uh, they prefer the garden tomb for its atmosphere of non-church. Uh, Catholics will visit the Holy Sepulchre. Protestants will visit the garden tomb and sometimes also the Holy Sepulchre. As I said, I'm not taking sides, but I'm going to take you now along the route of what is called the Station of the Cross. And here we are after the uh, produce a uh, production of uh, Jesus to uh, Pontius Pilate at the foundations today of the Antonia Fortress. Uh, Jesus is condemned. This is not the way it looked. The foundations are way below. But this archway, you see, dates to the time of Hadrian. He built it after a, a, a hundred years after the crucifixion. He built it because he wanted to obliterate the memory of early Christians who worshipped at that site as the first station where Jesus was condemned. And he wanted to obliterate it by building something very Roman. What you're seeing is the large arch two smaller arches. One can be actually seen in the church uh, of uh, 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 the Lithostrophus, the stone floor, um, and he builds it ironically to obliterate, but it certainly does the opposite. Because to this day, this arch marks for us the Ecce Homo arch, where, Ponti uh, where Pontius Pilatus uh, says, here is the man when he presents Jesus to the Roman soldiers to be taken to execution, crucifixion. So what he wanted to obliterate, he reinstates. Station one, the station of condemnation. Across the pavement is, who else? Antonio Maluzzi, a rebuilt Byzantine church built very close to the Lithostrophus, where Jesus is beaten, given a wooden cross to bear, and a crown of thorns to wear. Second station, the station of flagellation. The procession then begins and heads towards the outlet of the city. And here we will go to the next slide and see station three, where Jesus falls under the burden of the cross for the first time. Right beside station three, which today is occupied by the uh, Armenian Catholic Patriarch, Right beside it is probably the most painful station for Jesus. In the next slide, you shall see station four, where he meets his mother, Mary. On the road. Continuing towards the outlet of the city, he is passed by station five, a very important station for black Christians, because here, uh, most of these stations incidentally are actually mentioned in the gospel, including this one. Simon or Shimon, from Serenia helps carry the cross of Jesus. Now, Shimon is a Jewish name. Serenia is in Africa. And in the days where only a Judeo could be a Judeo Christian, Shimon is probably the very first black Christian. And hence, Station 5, a very important site for black Christians. This route leads up towards the outlet of the city where we pass by station six, which is purely a traditional station not mentioned in the Gospels. The station where Veronica, a young maiden, wipes the brow of Jesus and an image of his face remains on the handkerchief, not to be confused with the Shroud of Turin, and purely traditional station. And in fact, its very name tells us how it's very much a traditional station. Veronica, Vera Icon, from here, not mentioned as I said in the, in the Gospels, from here we get to the outlet of the city from the time of Jesus, the seventh station on First Street. Don't be confused, that's not eight, that's the seventh station on First Street, where Jesus falls under the burden of the cross for the second time as, being, as he's being led outside of the city. Now, if you will, now if you will, I'm sorry. It's telling me that uh, time is moving on and I have to hurry up. <clears throat> um, now, um, if you were going to the garden tomb, you'd turn right and you'd 
get uh, towards the Damascus Gate and get to the Garden too. But if you're following the ancient uh, uh, Via della Rosa, the old route, you come to Station 8. And unless you can walk through the wall, you cannot take the direct route because Helena, Constantine's mum, builds an enormous structure around the last stations of the cross. And the only way to continue uh, to the stations is to circumvent the walls uh, to Station 9. However, at Station 8, Jesus meets the women of Jerusalem and they are weeping. And he says, weep not for me, weep for Jerusalem. Station nine is where Jesus falls under the burden of the cross for the third time. To the right of the station is bedrock. At the St. Hellenic Coptic Church, you will find bedrock and a cistern dug into the bedrock. To the left of it is an enormous pit upon which an enormous structure, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, has been built. But in the time of Jesus, it was an abandoned stone quarry that uh, grave diggers would come in after the quarry is abandoned and make it a stone and make it a garden tomb. And from station nine, the third falling of Jesus, we come down to station 10, which is today covered by the chapel you see in front of you. It is the chapel where Jesus uh, is stripped of his clothing by the Roman soldiers. The rest of the stations, that's station 10 that you see there, the rest of the stations are all within this church, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. You can see the very Crusader additions to the entrance to this church. And as I said, you're going to need a tremendous amount of imagination to see it the way it would have been in the time of Jesus. Because as I said, abandoned stone quarries became garden tombs. Uh, and inside this church are the final stations. Station 11, the Franciscan Catholic station, where Jesus is nailed close to the very top of this skull-shaped rock to a wooden cross, Franciscan altar. Station 12, right beside it, is the Greek Orthodox altar, where the crosses are put upright, the central one, Jesus, and the two sides, the two That's thieves. Well. You see the marble and the glass covering this altar. That's because pilgrims would dig away with the with their fingernails to take a souvenir away, and the way to protect it was to cover it with marble and glass. Station twelve, where Jesus is put up on the wooden cross. You know, Joseph of Arimathea and uh, Nicodemus had some influence and probably a lot of money to bribe Pontius Pilatus with, and they arranged to have Jesus brought down from the cross a lot earlier than the Romans would normally allow. And because it was approaching the Jewish Sabbath and they wanted the burial to take place before the Sabbath. We Jews get into trouble with coroners all over the world, coroners all, all over the world because we want to bury straight after death. Uh, but uh, um, here with uh, Pontius Pilatus's agreement, Jesus is brought down from the cross before the Jewish burial, uh, Sabbath to be uh, properly uh, anointed, wrapped in a shroud and placed in the unused uh, family tomb of Joseph of Arimathea, the station 14 that lay in front of him. Now, the first Re thing- Ruben, is, there's a, a question that came in um, from Facebook from Janita um, asking about why there was a, a building placed around the final uh, stations is, and not left alone. Very good question. Uh, Helena, Saint Helena, Constantine's mother, thought it was very, very important to mark these sites by for all times by building altars and churches where anything of any uh, specially uh, uh, re uh, relevance took place. And thus, all sites that uh, were pointed out to her as holy sites, she built something around and over. And uh, the Holy Sepulchre was no exception. Any other questions from my uh, panel of delegation alumni up on, on the screen? We're, we're coming into our, our, our final uh, headway here. Uh, I know Don jumped in early. Anyone else with any questions before we move? No? Okay. Okay, so I want to uh, go back to that slide, please, the, the tomb. I want to explain why what should be a cave in the side of a cliff 
is a freestanding building. Helena again, when she is pointed out that cave where in the side of a cliff where Jesus was laid uh, in, she instructs that the rest of the caves be cut away and moved so that that cave will be a, a above ground, a freestanding monument. And it's only later in the 1700s that this edifice is built around it. Unfortunately, the, uh, uh, the actual tomb was badly destroyed by the Persians in 613 and then totally destroyed by El Hakim, the crazed uh, convert to Islam uh, uh, in 1000, the Egyptian ruler. So uh, very little part, only the back part of the tomb remains intact. But listen, why is this place so holy to Christianity? Not because of the crucifixion and the laying of the holy in the holy tomb, of course, but because of what happened when the three Marys come to visit on the Sunday morning. You may remember the gardener says to them, why do you come? Uh, to see, you don't see the living in the place of the dead. And uh, the resurrection site is marked as this tomb. And Helena, incidentally, calls it not the church of the holy tomb, but the church of resurrection. And only later is the dome enclosed. And thus, the resurrection, one of the three most important uh, mysteries of early Christianity uh, marks this site as very holy to Christians. As I said, on a, on a subsequent visit to Jerusalem, we may be able to visit uh, many other uh, sites that, where Christianity uh, and the, the miracles of Jesus take place. But now we're going to move to our final portion, and uh, that is Islam and Jerusalem. And as I said, it's an appropriate time because uh, the journey of Muhammad, according to the Quran, to a faraway place where he receives the Quran itself. Uh, although Jerusalem is not mentioned as this faraway place, the uh, spoken Islamic tradition, the Hadith, marks Jerusalem as the site where Muhammad in 610 comes to receive the Quran at a distant mosque. He prays at this distant mosque and he meets Abraham, Moses, and Jesus there. And thus this site from that time onwards becomes the third most important site to Islam in the world after Mecca and Medina. And the mosque itself that you see with a silver dome uh, slightly tarnished there uh, is called the distant mosque, the Al-Aqsa mosque that you shall see in the next slide. The Al-Aqsa Mosque, the distant mosque, is actually the third most holy site. Uh, and uh, I want to show you the facade of this uh, uh, mosque in the next slide, where you will see uh, the Crusader additions to some of it. But it is an absolutely beautiful building inside and out. It is built on top of uh, a hollow entrance to the Temple Mount that Herod the Great had built through the Hulda gates. So this mosque has a lot of underground space in what is wrongly called Solomon's uh, stables, which are really the grand entrance uh, through the Hulda gates that Herod the Great had, uh, had uh, built in his temple. And in the next slide, you'll see another uh, beautiful picture of the facade of the al Mosque that is not to be confused with this next slide, the Golden Dome which is not a mosque, but a monument, the Dome of the Rock. This uh, beautiful monument has been just, uh, damaged and repaired several times, with the last addition being the actual gold leaf uh, placed on the dome itself, real gold leaf. This uh, is the site where the Holy of Holies stood, in the first temple, in the second temple, very close proximity, as you can see, to the western wall and uh, on the temple mount itself and it is from here that uh, it is believed that Muhammad ascended to the seven levels of heaven returning with the Quran and thus the temple mount and particularly the Al-Aqsa mosque 
becomes the third most important site to Islam in the world after Mecca and Medina. You know, unfortunately today, it is not possible for non-Muslims to visit the Al-Aqsa Mosque of the Dome of the Rock. This might change, I hope, in the future. But there are beautiful, beautiful buildings, and I want to take you inside the Dome of the Rock from a time where it was possible to actually enter and take pictures. What you're seeing there is the mosaic ceiling of the dome and uh, um, some inscriptions of the surah, the uh, passages from the Quran in Arabic around the sides. Following side, you will see some more of the beautiful marble work and decorations in inside this building. Uh, that incidentally, I have to tell you, was a perfection of the Byzantine churches that uh, were, uh, those of you who have been to Israel before, remember uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, church on the Mount of Beatitudes, with two concentric circles, the inner one holding up the dome, Antonio Bellucci again, of course, and outside the alcoves. Well, this was a standard Byzantine uh, structure that was beautiful, but the Muslims perfected it. They perfected it mathematically uh, in proportion. And this building is really one of the most spectacular buildings that one can walk through. Reuven, I want to try to get a quick question in from Rosa before we uh, uh, close up on the slides. Rosa, go ahead. Reuben, thank you so much for this wonderful presentation. And I just have a comment and a question. One of the most striking um, aspects of my trip to Israel, which I'm so grateful for still, um, was to see the combination of religions in Jerusalem and how they're connected. And I was very honored to be able to go to most of the holy sites when I was there. And my question to you is more like, what do you think is the significance today of having all these religions in one, um, in one space um, and all these practices and all these idiosyncrasies? How do you think that defines Jerusalem today? And the question is more connecting the history with what's happening in Jerusalem um, today, which is an extraordinary city. Well, I'm giving you my personal opinion here, of course. I think it's a message to all the world that uh, whether you are Muslim, Christian, or Jewish, you're the same. You're, you're worshipping the one God. You're the same. And you know what emphasizes this for me? At the rare moments when you hear the church bells, the Muslim, the Muslim call to prayer, and the Jews praying in the synagogue or the shofar blowing. It's beautiful harmony. The sounds go together. And uh, inshallah, one day we will learn from the sounds going together and we will be together in one Jerusalem. Reuben, that's, a, it, that's an, indeed a beautiful vision and, uh, uh, and, and an appropriate one for Yom Yerushalayim. Um, you know, our intention with trying to cover a few thousand years of history and three major uh, religions in the course of a Zoom session was, of course, to be rather uh, ambitious as we've been throughout this webinar series, but with the graciousness of, of Reuven. And uh, I can tell you, Reuven, you have fans from uh, uh, delegations passed all over the country. Uh, Lynn, who was on the, the trip with uh, Jeanette as well, just wrote in saying you were actually her favorite part of uh, uh, memory from uh, uh, traveling in Jerusalem. We have other people who said it was Hezekiah's Tunnel. So when you're up against Hezekiah's Tunnel, uh, that's pretty good competition. There are other people uh, that uh, uh, said a, uh, a bagel, uh, a sesame bagel was the, the favorite memory mm -hmm. from Jerusalem. So you're sandwiched somewhere in between history and uh, the, the culinary senses of, of Jerusalem. Uh, <laughs> Let, let, let me just, uh, uh, before I'll give you the last word to, uh, to, to send everybody off on, but I, I do want to acknowledge the fact that, that um, as we've been doing this series, and some of you know that our, our last uh, visit with uh, Reuven was up north in uh, Kasaria, uh, but uh, each week that we've been doing this over the last uh, uh, several weeks, we've uh, attempted to bring people together to take your minds off of other issues uh, uh, at the moment and, and being in isolation. And we do that as part of this broader campaign that we created at American Israel Friendship League called Friends in Deeds, where uh, today we're announcing our ninth uh, $500 donation 
of Israeli foods and treats uh, to vulnerable communities and frontline medical staff uh, that are battling COVID-19. And this week's recipient of our Friends in Deeds donation um, will be made to the Francis Tuttle Technology Center, uh, where the lead respiratory therapy instructor, uh, Christina Wynn, is overseeing the distribution to respiratory therapists at Intragris Canadian Valley in Yukon and Intragris Baptist Hospital in Oklahoma City. And I know we have, uh, uh, in addition to Don, we have other people from Oklahoma uh, that are on the call today. Uh, so we're excited to make that uh, a donation. And you saw on the screen uh, our web and other social handles that you can look over the last nine weeks at some of the faces behind the masks of the people who are on the front lines today who are serving. So uh, uh, Reuven, any final words before uh, we, we, we close out today? Yes, I would ask you to keep in mind the Psalm, Psalm 122, especially the sixth line. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. They shall prosper that love thee. One small piece of real estate so holy to the three great monotheistic religions of the world. Beautiful. Um, and uh, again, just a, 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 a program announcement, because uh, we're going to keep going. As long as we're stuck in our houses, uh, uh, we know that there's love to share and there are memories that can bring us joy and that we need to do this. We need to build community. So next week, if you had a lot to eat this weekend at your barbecues and whatever else everyone's doing to keep sane, uh, next week we got Pilates. So uh, our colleague, Naomi Reinhartz, is uh, with a little help from some instructors in Tel Aviv and in New York are gonna get you up and moving. So uh, come back and join us. And for those of you that are wondering when you can get your next Bissell of Reuven, we got an answer for you. This series of the virtual tours is so popular, we're just continuing it monthly. So on June 16th, we are going to visit with Reuven to, wait for it, Masada. Masada. We're going to Masada. So, uh, 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 so come back and join us. We're going to have a lot of fun with it. Uh, the only way to visit Masada comfortably in June is virtually. <laughs> Great. Um, Those who have been there in June, July, and August know what I'm talking about. Correct, correct. It, 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 uh, last time I was there in February, it started to rain when I was there with the Presbyterian Minister's Mission. So Masada is always full of surprises, even if you think you know the story. So come back and join us. For those of you celebrating Memorial Day this weekend or Shavuos in the coming week, we want to extend our wishes from the entire America-Israel Friendship League family for a meaningful holiday. And to all of you celebrating with us today from Yom Yerushalayim, permit me to say L'Shana Habab, Yerushalayim, Alo Virtuali. Next year, hopefully it won't be virtual. Goodbye, everyone. Have a great Hello. week. Hello. Have a safe week. Lovely to be with you.